Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Over the past several weeks, the emphasis in what can be regarded as the Iran crisis has shifted from belligerent rhetoric to indirect diplomacy, as well as an apparent beginning of confidence-building measures. Do the latest developments indicate a mutual effort at de-escalation, or are they merely a pause in an inevitable military confrontation? To analyze this question, we're joined here in the studio by Dr. Raz Zimt, who is an Iran expert at the Institute for National Security Studies. Welcome. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Dr. Menachem el Khavi, who is a research fellow at the Truman Institute at Hebrew University at okay. Jerusalem. Welcome. Mr. Oren, give us a broader update on the latest developments pertaining to this topic. Well, Jonathan, um, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei and President Donald Trump uh, are like two prize fighters in the ring, uh, poised to uh, hit each other, but for the time being, they're only shadow boxing. And uh, both of them uh, have taken to Twitter, Khamenei too, of course, uh, Trump is the grandmaster of them all, uh, tweeting uh, uh, policy statements, uh, even those um, not known to his subordinates before they uh, see them, but Khamenei also joined him. And uh, it seems as if uh, Donald Trump is now courting the Iranians. He has been calling on them uh, to uh, start a dialogue. Um, both Trump and his Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, have said, you know how to reach us, either through the uh, Swiss or through the Japanese Prime Minister who is visiting, or the uh, Germans or the French. Um, however, uh, while they are doing that, the Americans uh, have also put the uh, petrochemical industry in Iran on the uh, terrorist list, um, especially um, those entities which help the revolutionary guards. And the Iranians have started um, or enlarged their uranium enrichment uh, project, even though they are careful not to reach uh, those limits uh, which are set in the Joint Comprehensive uh, Plan of Action. Uh, of 2015. Dr. Tzimt, at this moment, the Iranians are indeed enriching more uranium than before, but the IAEA Director General, Mr. Yuki Amano, has indicated that uh, his agency does not have the tools necessary or the means at their disposal to actually verify whether they are in breach of uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is the technical term for the nuclear deal with uh, the Islamic Republic. To what degree does the West and the international community at large need to be concerned with uh, the fact that the Iranians are once again uh, rushing towards potentially acquiring nuclear weapons? Well, I think the main concern should be in, in a month from today, because a month ago, President Rouhani already said that Iran is going to accelerate the enriching, enriching uh, uranium. Uh, in, th in 60 days, he said Iran might uh, enrich uranium above 3.5%, uh, per, uh, uh, which is a breach, uh, breach of the uh, JCPOA. So I think we, we still have to wait a month, uh, another month, to see whether Iran is going to, uh, to say, well, we're out of the deal and, and we uh, perhaps we uh, enrich uranium more than we are entitled uh, according to the JCPOA. This, this might be uh, the, the, big, the biggest concern, because right now it doesn't seem to me that Iran has made any significant uh, efforts against the JCPOA. Dr. Mechavi, when we're looking at the date uh, that uh, Dr. Tsimt mentioned, uh, specifically the 8th of July, which mm -hmm. is the date where uh, the Iranians may indeed breach, uh, or maybe they might breach before or after, of course, uh, the question of uh, being able to verify uh, that is uh, uh, still on the table. Do you believe that the international community will react harshly, as the Europeans have indicated already? Uh, alluding to the fact that the uh, so-called blackmail or uh, the uh, point where the Iranians told their European counterparts, unless we benefit from the deal, we're not going to abide by it. Right. Well, I, I don't know if militarily speaking there's going to be such a reaction. I, I find it very hard to, to believe that this is going to happen. Uh, I think what the international community, especially Europe, can do is to... Uh, 
Well, for example, to prevent Iran from having some kind of counter or bypassing measures to counter the American uh, uh, sanctions, which is really what Iran had in mind. And I think it's one of the reasons Iran is, you know, running around shaking hands now to whoever it can to try to bypass at least some of the sanctions, at least to soften some of the sanctions that President Trump um, has has renewed or has enacted recently. On the other hand, I, when it comes to Iran itself, I think the Islamic Republic is walking a thin line, but it will do its best not to cross it. It goes, same goes actually to all those maneuvers time and again that we hear about in the Gulf where, you know, it seems like really on very close to the point of collision and yet uh, miraculously, so to speak, it, you know, the collision does not happen. So I think Iran will do anything it can to avoid a head-on collision. That's been its strategy all along. Uh, and, for example, one of the things I think it's been trying to do now is to mirror Trump's, uh, uh, President Trump's, uh, uh, you know, efforts to, uh, to threaten Iran by having a leverage, for example, getting close to breaching the JCPOA with enrichment is having a certain leverage. Now we have something to bargain from, because otherwise Iran has very little to bargain actually on when, when it, it's th threatened by the West, especially by the U.S. Mr. Olin. Miscalculation has been the word used by uh, the Trump administration, by senior military officials, as well as by their uh, partners and allies, that that would be the key uh, to preventing uh, actually a full uh, conflagration or regional conflict. Do you believe that uh, this miscalculation can be averted, as has been done thus far, even though the, the proximity between Iranian forces and U.S. forces, as well as uh, U.S. Uh, partners in the region, has been uh, quite uh, concerning. Uh, what we have seen uh, recently uh, are several incidents between Russian and American planes, as well as uh, naval uh, assets, ships. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, of more concern than what uh, has happened uh, in the Gulf uh, up to now. But of course, if you have uh, a carrier, an aircraft carrier task force, which is not only the uh, carrier itself, the Abram Lincoln, but all of those uh, cruisers and destroyers and smaller vessels, submarines probably, although you don't uh, see them, and marines aboard landing ships, uh, if you get all of them into the uh, narrow bottle of the Persian Gulf, uh, they may, uh, of course, uh, take part in, in some friction. And um, eventually, it may come to um, a commander, which is a, the equivalent of a lieutenant colonel, um, a, a relatively junior officer, having to decide, uh, recording to the rules of engagement, whether to open fire or expose uh, his ship to uh, to attack, and uh, the uh, commanders of um, the U.S. Navy uh, ships are usually told don't take too many risks. Risks are for diplomats, but if you have someone uh, approaching you um, in a very threatening fashion, force protection uh, is paramount. However, there is a lot of hypocrisy in the American position because the State Department. Uh, uh, spokespersons have come out warning the Iranians not to breach the JCPOA, even though the Americans themselves have revoked it. Um, but um, the way one can, can see uh, Trump trying to walk back from the brink is by emphasizing the term changing their behavior. We don't want to war with them. All we want them is to change their behaviors behavior um, in several parameters. Even though the the date, the 8th of July, is a crucial date pertaining to the nuclear uh, agreement, uh, in but particular this, also to the American perception, because President Trump was also quite clear, if you do breach the, the internationally agreed upon terms uh, with regard indeed. to uranium production, the United States will react possibly indeed, militarily. Indeed, but, but uh, this, of course, puts the onus on the Iranians. And the question is, how do you interpret their behavior? Of course, uh, President Macron of France also came out and listed the various uh, uh, fields in which Iran uh, should behave better. 
ballistic missiles and what happens uh, through its proxies. Which was also part of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Well, again, um, if, if you want to be legalistic about it, uh, there are other nations in the Middle East, including Israel, uh, who disregarded what the UN uh, Security Council called on them to do, for instance, uh, in 2016 regarding settlements. So one can't really pick and choose what resolutions uh, people should abide by and uh, what uh, they could uh, ignore. But nevertheless, um, it's fluid enough so that if uh, President Trump wants to say that Iran has started to change its behavior, he can. It's up to him, the way he also handled North Korea. Dr. Tzimt, Iran's malign activities, that was the core reason for the Trump administration to decide to withdraw from uh, the nuclear agreement, even though it was a flawed agreement pertaining to uh, the nuclear aspects of things, because it uh, uh, provided a lot of leeway and, and, of course, the sunset clause and so on, where the Iranians could, after 10 years, with actually an upgraded uh, centrifuge database, uh, have a, a closer breakpoint to getting out and uh, acquiring nuclear weapons, for that matter. Uh, but when we're looking at the current situation, there seems to be a, a shift of uh, uh, the statements made out there with regard to Iran's uh, malign activities, once again directing more specifically to its nuclear aspirations rather than its activities in Syria or in Lebanon or in uh, Yemen for that matter. Do you believe that uh, Iran is trying to play the game where it tries to divert the international attention from its activities throughout the region and its aspirations with regard to uh, its uh, movements right now with, once again, accelerating its centrifuge production rate? Well, first of all, I think we, we still have to, to wait and see what the Americans really want Iran to do. Because on the, on the one side, you have the 12 demands made by Pompeo concerning three different uh, areas. One is the missiles, second is, the, is uh, Iran's support for terrorism and subversive activity in the region, and the third issue is the nuclear issue. But then, as you said, uh, the, the recent statements from Washington indicate that perhaps the nuclear issue is still the number one issue and that the, the prospect for a grand bargain with Iran seems very, uh, very weak. Uh, I, I think that what Iran has been trying to do is to uh, gain more leverages in both issues. First of all, uh, concerning the nuclear issue, and that's why they try to accelerate the uh, enrichment of, of uranium. That's one thing. And the second issue is to, to, to make a point, both the United States to its L and to the American allies in the region, especially Saudi Arabia, that if the, the pressure continues uh, on Iran, it might take some uh, steps concerning its regional policy as, as well. So uh, such strategy of maximum pressure has its toll, but, uh, not just on Iran, but also on American allies in the region. Dr. Merhavi, your colleague from the Truman Institute at Hebrew University, Jerusalem, who is also a frequent guest here, Dr. Eldad Pardo, uh, has uh, indicated several months ago, actually, that uh, in his assessment, the United States and Iran have already started negotiations uh, by rhetoric to the public and also activities on the ground. Is this now cycle of uh, attempts to de-escalate the situation and trying to figure out ways to come to terms with the current situation part of those negotiations? Is that a uh, assessment that we should maybe consider? Including the release of a prisoner of Lebanese descent. Right. Yes, I, I, I think it is part of a, a weird kind of negotiation, really. It's not what we often think of as negotiation. Uh, I do want to point at a great difference. I think there is between uh, uh, Dr. Timid, uh, you know, uh, mentioned three different topics, you know, the missiles, the nuclear deal. Uh, nuclear issue, enrichment, and also the uh, terrorist and subversive activities. I think there's a great difference between subversive and terrorist activities and the other two. And that is that with, with uh, what Iran sees as its natural expansion in the region, you know, its base in Syria and Lebanon, etc., uh, that is something Iran actually cannot negotiate on. So I think Iran's interest, the Islamic Republic's interest today is to have the spotlight on the nuclear issue uh, at, at first, and then second would be the missile. And that is because the nuclear thing is, is something you can postpone 10, 5, 10 years from now uh, and decide that it's not in the best interest of Iran. If Iran is going to be out of Syria now, 
who could vouch that he will ever get back there? Uh, so I think there is a great difference between the two. And Iran's interest today is actually to have the spotlight on the nuclear issue, you know, 1% more, 1% less. Uh, that is the kind of negotiations Iran loves. <laughs> While uh, evacuating, uh, uh, you know, uh, bases in Syria is something Iran really would not want world attention to be on and would never want to to even hear about. Which we will uh, touch more on this program uh, a bit later on. I'd like you to elaborate on the point that Iran has released a uh, Lebanese national, actually, who was uh, allegedly uh, um, charged with uh, uh, being uh, an agent of the West. Uh, this is the way the Iranians have referred to him uh, and has been supposed to be incarcerated in Iran for 10 years, as well as uh, a fine of $4 million or so, and he was now brought back to Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon. Tell us more about that. The Iranians are, of course, uh, masters of uh, bargaining um, uh, in the Grand Bazaar and elsewhere, and uh, more specifically in hostage-taking uh, for um, ransom of, of various uh, sorts. We all remember the uh, Iran-gate um, affair of the 1980s. In the United States, um, uh, what uh, took the limelight was the Iran-Contra part of it. Uh, funds diverted for the use of the Contras in Nicaragua against the express wish of Congress. But what really happened was that the Iranians, either directly or through Hezbollah, had hostages and then released them in exchange for weapons which they needed for the war against Iraq. And what we now have is that there are several Americans, either citizens or residents, the, the exact status isn't important, because the families in the United States are putting pressure on the government to bring about the release. Uh, there is, of course, the retired FBI um, uh, officer Levinson and others who have been... Uh, either held or disappeared in Iran several years ago. And if the Iranians now release them, uh, they get uh, the benefit uh, of public relations um, and a confidence uh, building measure. But one should also uh, note that the nuclear business itself is a sort of a bargain because the Iranians know full well that neither Israel nor the United States, nor for that matter the international community, will let them get a nuclear weapon. This is against uh, their signature on the non-proliferation treaty, uh, with or without the additional protocol. This is a nuance, it doesn't really matter. But they, they have promised not to do it. They have gotten benefits because of that. And Israel, of course, once Iran reaches uh, nuclear weapon capability, will strike it. So for them, um, uh, there's no sense in really getting a nuclear weapon. The threat of getting closer to a nuclear weapon is all important to them because in exchange for that, they got the deal in 2015. Now they want to get a better deal, what, what uh, President Trump calls a new improved deal. So they will negotiate for it. Nevertheless, North Korea at the time also promised not to do so and uh, uh, tried to realize certain uh, international agreements, and, and nobody expected them to actually reach that break point. But, 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 there, is, no, but reality there is has fooled us all. There is a significant uh, difference. North Korea all of a sudden announced that it is a nuclear weapon state, and now if you want us to de nuclearize, you have to pay us, which President Clinton and his successors did to no avail. Iran is still years ahead uh, from getting a weapon. Actually, for the last 16 years, uh, it has stopped working on its uh, nuclear weapon project. Of course, it has taken several steps which will enable it to break out towards uh, this uh, project. Dr. Tim, how do you perceive this? I think the main question right now is, first of all, whether it's possible to uh, renew negotiations between the United States and Iran. I have to say that my, uh, my assessment is that I, I don't get the, the impression that Khamenei right now is uh, in the mood of renewing the, the negotiations. He was quite hesitant from the beginning to negotiate with the United States. He always said we should not trust the Americans. 
And so for him to renew negotiations, especially with this kind of administration, which he considers to be an, an administration which uh, strives for regi regime change uh, in Iran, is not something uh, easy. Uh, nevertheless, we should not rule out the possibility of negotiations, but just for the sake of negotiations, because my, my impression is that Iran's main strategy today is to buy more time until 2020. It wants to uh, wait uh, Trump uh, out. It wants to. It, it hopes that he won't be re-elected. Uh, if he's re-elected, re I think it will be very difficult for Iran to contain the sanctions for more years, and then we might see uh, renewed negotiations. I think, by the way, that Israel should be very concerned because I'm not sure Trump is going to to get a much better deal. Uh, I'm not sure he wants a much better deal. Uh, and such cosmetic changes, uh, for example, if the uh, limitations on Iran's nuclear program are not between 8 to 15 years, but from 15 to 20 years, it won't make such a difference for the state of Israel. And I can't uh, imagine that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu will be, uh, uh, will be able to come, uh, come out against such a deal, especially if Trump is the president. Dr. Mechavi, earlier you mentioned Syria and uh, Iran's military entrenchment there. Just uh, earlier this week, there was a report uh, from the Saudi-owned uh, London-based Shalk al-Awsa daily, which uh, quoted uh, and received actually details unveiling uh, a massive military entrenchment, uh, uh, not only along Israel's border, but in the entire area which Jerusalem has designated as uh, it's red line, basically, for Iranian forces to be there, including uh, uh, Fatah 10 uh, missiles, which are short-range uh, ballistic missiles capable of carrying both biological and nuclear warheads uh, for uh, quite pinpoint accurate attacks. To what degree do you think that uh, uh, this unveiling, even though Israeli intelligence uh, uh, officers have indicated that uh, they knew about all this uh, information already uh, before the publishing of uh, the report and are dealing with uh, the Iranians in Syria quite systematically. Yeah, so I think that the great achievement, and here Iran can in a way actually point to a uh, simply a success uh, of its policy because in the, the, the presence in Syria has been kind of taken for granted now. It's there's just the question is just where exactly in Syria is Iran going to have its bases and what is the line and what uh, uh, but but there's no uh, no one actually disputes Iran's very existence in Syria now. Uh, and on the one hand it enjoys a certain Russian blanket uh, efficient more or less, it depends, uh, because Israel has done a lot to uh, try to, you know, to make that blanket as thin as possible. And yet the blanket is there. It's not really a blanket the way Iran, Iran maybe wanted, that it, will be, um, that it would be actually protected from Israeli attacks. It, it's been proven not to be. But the fact is that the Russians, who do have a large say in what's going on in Syria now, do accept Iranian presence, and the West, including Israel to some degree, have actually acquiesced with that. I mean, Israel has just pointed at certain things, certain missiles it would not have, and certain lines, you know, a certain point in the southern part of Syria that it would not have Iranian presence, but the Iranian presence as such is already a fact. And uh, everybody's reading about the missiles, but what I think is more significant in the long run is Iranian uh, proselytizing, for example, and, and converting people to Shiite Islam in Syria. So Iran, I think, is, you know, is looking five, uh, ten years ahead, uh, and Syria is going to be quite different during that time. Many uh, forced conversions, indeed. Uh, Mr. Oren, would you agree that Israel should be concerned with regard to the current situation? Israel uh, was, is, and should still be concerned about the Iranian presence in Syria. This is uh, a real danger because Israel has uh, most recently seen Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hezbollah in Syria and various militias uh, in Syria as its main uh, and most urgent enemy. And if Iran is there to uh, backstop uh, Hezbollah, of course, it's a problem for Israel. But the nuclear issue has not been uh, an Israeli concern over the last three or four years. And actually, the Israeli military enjoyed the benefits 
of the uh, JCPOA. The Iranians say that they did not enjoy the benefits, but Israel did because the Israeli military could divert its attention and resources to other more pressing issues. Well, we're drawing here to the end of the program, so I'd like to give each and every one of you the ability to have a, a closing assessment. Dr. Tim, we'll start with you. I think the main question is still whether the sanctions and um, the maximum pressure policy of the United States will be effective. Now, if you, if you try to evaluate the effectiveness of the sanctions only through the economic issue, then yes, uh, uh, sanctions have been very uh, effective. Uh, uh, you, the situation in Iran, the economic situation in Iran has deteriorated, deteriorated sub substantially. But I think we still have to see whether the sanctions are effective to achieve two main objectives. One is dramatic change in Iran's policy and or a regime change. And I have to, to admit that I don't see at this stage uh, those two objectives being uh, being fulfilled. Dr. Mekhavi? I think the real drama in a way is, is actually might be inside Iran between the two factions, so to speak, even though one has really the, the, the last say now in, when it comes to foreign policy. And yet uh, one cannot, I think, totally ignore the fact that part of Iranian leadership uh, thinks the price is too too heavy to pay, and they might have a, a larger say in the future. Mr. Owen? Um, the Iranians are known for having personal grudges. Uh, Khomeini um, had such animosity towards Jimmy Carter that he waited until Ronald Reagan uh, was in office before he released the 52 hostages 444 days after the capture of the uh, embassy. So we have to see what happens with Trump a year and a half from now, after that, policy on either side could change. And Israel uh, in the picture, do you believe that there will be more of the same or will there be an escalation of some sort? Israel is taking a back seat. It will do nothing without American approval. Well, this is all the time that we're for today, so I'd like to thank Dr. Tzimt, Mr. Oren, and Dr. Merchavi for being here today. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.